Welcome to Mindful Life 66. Yes, Mindful Life 66. It is Monday the 11th of April. You know, every, every single evening when I'm on this live and I'm seeing the date, I am, I, like, on the computer, I see the number. I see them say 11 of the 4th. And there's a split second where my mind questions, do you really know which month is this number? Because March is at the tip of my tongue, and I know it's April. But yes, we are speeding quickly along with the year. It's the 11th of April. Yes, and it's Mindful Live number 66. I'm Nathan Springer, your host, and welcome. It's good to have you here. I am streaming on TikTok, on Instagram, and also on YouTube. If you're looking live on TikTok or Instagram, and you'd like to see what those other 65 lives were about, yes, there were 65 lives before this, and you'd like to see them, feel free to subscribe to my YouTube channel, Nathan Springer, over on YouTube, because the lives that are streamed are saved over there, and you can go over there and see them, and there are also some other videos from previously, and when I make other content, I would also upload it on youtube so feel free to go over there and subscribe to my youtube channel and for those of you over on the tiktok live the chat there is usually the most active but there are moderators and we like to keep a certain level of discourse so yeah let's keep with that all right so what we're talking about today, at least what we're starting talking about today, is what I did the contemplation on today also. The gas prices. And people have been asking about this for a while and talking about this file. But, you know, I was letting things settle. Sometimes with news, you know, you want to see everything that comes out of a story before you really dive in there and you're rushing too fast. So, yes, TikTok, at least in the live, in the chat, is the most vibes. I will not deny that. So, fuel prices are set to rise in Trinidad and Tobago. Now, it is not unique to Trinidad and Tobago, as people keep pointing out over and over. Fuel prices are rising all around the world, partly because of the bacchanal going on with Russia and Ukraine. And then, even before that, there were supply chain problems. And yeah, you know how it all goes. So, fuel prices are on the rise. But Trinidad and Tobago, we are we are merchants of this of this fuel that is is rising in price we are merchants of this commodity we are supposed to be producing this so if the prices are set to rise we are supposed to be making more money and if we're making more money why are we now paying more for the very thing that we are pulling out of our soil and i understand that completely however the thing is when we pull it out of our soil it's not like we pr we process it right here and then send it out to the quick shop and say hey sell it for whatever price we see to sell it for the price of this commodity is set globally we do not have control over that we do not have control over the fuel prices set globally that is a fact that's just the truth of it now what we do have control over is the subsidy that the government is paying in now i've seen the in the contemplation i i highlighted this because i saw some posts like this and they were very serious they were talking about people pointing out that the government doesn't have control over the fuel prices that's international and it's true but the same could be said of nearly every private company and when we didn't like the chocolate digestive raising price we kicked a, a fuss about that when we didn't like the two dollars on the commodity and the condiments we kicked a fuss about that and they changed it now here's the thing to be very honest with you i don't know if i believe that kfc changed that condiment business solely because of public pressure i don't know the inner workings of prestige holdings i don't know we used to process here though they closed the refinery even if we did process here that would not change the fact that the price we would pay for the fuel is the international price regardless of what we do we could pull out five billion barrels per day the price we pay is the internet well if we pulled out five billion barrels per day maybe we'd have more control over the international prices but either way the international price is the price we pay the only change on that is when the government helps us pay some. How the government helps us pay some is by the subsidy. That's what the government has been doing for quite some time now. And I understand the subsidy totally. If we are producing this natural resource... I'm 
not sure what you're speaking about then you see but if we're producing this natural resource you could understand why like all right we're producing it we shouldn't be paying an insane price for it we should be able to at least get get the get the goods from our own commodities we should at least get some benefit from this and i understand that sentiment and i kind of agree with it to be very honest i kind of agree with it but the reality must always be understood in the idea of an opportunity cost if you pay two billion dollars to keep fuel prices low you will not have the two billion dollars to pay into something else now the thing is our prices are still comparatively very low we still have the second lowest prices in the caribbean now we don't have the lowest prices around the world that is a fact many people like to point that out and the truth is many of the other nations with lower fuel prices are just similar to us nations with an abundance of oil resources so they take those resources and reward their citizens with it now i find something very interesting when i look at that list i look at the list and i wonder how many of the nations above us above us meaning beneath us in prices you understand how these lists would be how many of those nations would i actually prefer to live in to be a citizen of to be patriotic towards we are going to look at that and we are going to see how many of us would prefer to live in any of those nations that have comparable fuel prices to us so globalpetrolprices.com tells us the global petrol prices kind of self-explanatory that's another benefit to the youtube though the tiktok has the chat and the chat is always pumping the youtube has the benefit of seeing the articles behind me so yeah they have that benefit but you could always go back and view it again no problem with that you could view it as many times as you like over on YouTube, Christopher Scott says the population of this country is only a fat first and it takes serious things last. But look at it now, you're paying $100 for $60 worth of gas from the last two years. Now, th that's a strange thing. That's a strange thing. Are we paying $100 now for $60 worth of gas? Or were we always paying much less for gas than it was actually worth? And the government was the one taking up that bill. Question Is gasoline and diesel a byproduct? crude oil and not natural gas yes that is true and our main production in trinidad and tobago that's some you you made a very interesting point but when you get too fine to the nuances sometime it could go far but our main product <laughs> our main product our main natural resource is actually natural gas over here in trinidad and tobago not the crude oil that gives you those fuels for vehicles so that's just by the way and also by the way they did not remove the subsidy on the product that comes from natural gas our lpg our our gas tanks are still very very cheap i like to point out because i looked at that comparatively with barbados just in the previous lives last week that we're paying lower 20 dollars for something that in barbados may cost you around 120 dollars just by the way but as we are on the note of comparisons if you look at this list there are quite a few countries above us and this list is from the it, it was updated on the 4th of april 2022 if you look at this list there are quite a few nations above us in cheap fuel prices one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen seventeen eighteen nineteen twenty twenty one twenty two twenty three twenty four twenty five twenty six twenty seven twenty eight nations above us we are 29th according to this list now let's look at these nations that are all above us and i would like the chat to tell me any one of these nations any one of these nations that you would prefer to live in someone over on youtube asked is it a good idea to put a cap on the gas so it won't be ever growing ever growing in hiking price how do you put a cap on the gas we don't control the gas prices how exactly do you put a cap on the gas prices the only way you put a cap on gas gas prices is by subsidizing the difference that's what a cap on gas prices are a cap on gas prices is that the the you're my child i have a child and you go to the roti shop to buy a roti for lunch every day and i give you some allowance 
or you make some money doing whatever odd jobs you do you make five dollars and the roti at the beginning was always five dollars now due to the vagaries of the market the roti price has now reached 25 dollars so you still go with a five dollars and ask them for a roti in the roti shop and they give you the roti for five dollars what is actually happening is not that the roti shop is still selling you it for five dollars no at the end of the week the roti shop tallies up all the extra twenty dollars and they bring that bill for me your father and say hey you have to pay this for the week for your child and that is what happens that's the only way you cap the prices on an international commodity why we even need to compare bottom line is cost of living high this fuel hike will make it worse that is not the bottom line fab khalifa the reason we need to compare is we need to look at things as compared to reality if i am comparing my country to utopia then obviously why don't we and why don't we and we could just and we could just and we could pay out a million dollars subs a billion dollars subsidy and we could keep all the social programs running and we could keep pension at 60 and we could keep this here keep urp and we could keep cpap and we could raise the pay for all wasa workers and we could raise the pay for all t and tech workers and all ninety thousand of the public servants can get their pay increases yeah if we compare it to utopia and somewhere that does not exist then we could say things like that but if we compare it to the reality of places that exist we could understand how we live in context to the world around us and understand where our expectations should lie and how we do make change. this isn't saying that we don't make changes but it, it allows us to be, be more realistic in the direction we go towards changes so it allows us to understand that maybe maybe if we all come out on the 19th of this month and pull up our handbrakes in the middle of the highway as i've seen many people suggest that that won't actually do anything it cannot do anything does anyone remember the point of the subsidy in the first place all right so let's go down the list the, the, the place with the cheapest fuel in the world, Venezuela. An autocracy with a failing but with a failing budget a long time now. And though their prices seem so cheap, the price of fuel actually in Venezuela is higher than the market value because you cannot get fuel in the regular places. You must buy fuel on the black market and then pay the, pay the black market costs. The next place, Libya, which may be due to American in influence to be very honest but either way that place might accurately be described as a hellhole right now there are open air slave markets currently in libya and even before the fall of gaddafi libya was not a place to be a regular civilian gaddafi although he may have had lofty dreams of africa and for africa his dreams always involved him at the top with a cadre of women of any age that he can choose at any time he wills so libya was never an ideal place let's go down the list third on the list iran how many of you are going to line up to go live in iran i highly doubt any next syria civil war anyone next algeria algeria is the largest country in africa but constantly in a state of turmoil i believe they are they are currently ruled by a dictatorship for the last what 20 or 30 years i'm not sure but good night mindful very good idea april 19 shut down we must unite yeah all right next on the list kuwait where's kuwait oh right another autocracy ruled by dictatorship next on the list angola out of africa oh are they a nice thriving democracy no actually they are not they are ruled by a military general i believe nigeria one of the countries known for having the most rampant corruption turkmenistan one of the soviet republics known for corruption kazakhstan again another soviet republic known for corruption malaysia I don't think anyone here is going to go to live in the Islamic Republic of Malaysia, Iraq, or Egypt, maybe Bahrain, or Bolivia. Go search Bolivia government corruption and see what list comes up. Qatar, Azerbaijan, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Oman, 
Ethiopia. There may be a positive place. Ethiopia has been one of those thriving independent countries for a very long time. But Ethiopia is currently rife with civil, civil war. People dying by the thousands constantly. Haiti. Haiti is the only Caribbean territory, only Caribbean country that has lower fuel prices. Uh -huh, sure you'd live there. That has lower fuel prices than Trinidad and Tobago. Now... How does Haiti have lower fuel prices than Trinidad and Tobago, you might ask? Does Haiti produce oil and gas? No, not really. Haiti was part of the deal with the Dragon Oil. I don't know how many of you all remember that the Dragon Oil, however, Dragon Fuel, or Dragon Gas, or however Venezuela called it. When Chavez had a plan to, you know, he, he was going to usurp American authority in the Caribbean using more Soviet-style, more socialist-style economics. For the people and he started to sell very cheap fuel to the caribbean territories unfortunately venezuela's system was not sustainable so haiti had cheap fuel for quite some time and as fuel raised around the world the haitian government decided that they would do as the person is asking over on youtube petro caribe thank you that the person was doing over on youtube they would cut the prices of their gas all their fuels are capped at a bottom low price in haiti costing their government in haiti hundreds of millions of us dollars when they could barely handle it but here's the problem that they're facing in haiti they started the subsidy i think in 2011 or something like that they started their own subsidy every time this isn't even funny this isn't even funny but it's kind of the reason i'm smiling at it is thinking about it in juxtaposition to trinidad and tobago people are talking about rioting here the reality is over in haiti every single time there's even a whisper of removing the fuel subsidy there's literal rioting there, there isn't talk about rioting there isn't talk about going into the streets and sitting in our air-conditioned vehicles and stopping no those people go and start to burn down the the cities and towns because they literally cannot afford more expensive fuel one of the benefits that AT has though is that generally speaking the amount of fuel that they use isn't as as grand as ours but that subsidy is killing haiti's economy and they cannot stop it because the people protest every time they attempt to yeah that's the subsidy over in haiti colombia ecuador belarus tunisia kyrgyzstan and pakistan make off all of the other what 28 countries above us in fuel prices in other words if you were to take a general view of freedom of all of the countries the top 30 countries along with us with the cheapest fuel prices in the world there's almost assuredly there's almost assuredly no other place that you would willingly go to live that is the reality many people speak about hypotheticals and i wouldn't mind living in oman and i wouldn't mind living in malaysia and etc 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 but then these are the people that are ultimately addicted to the freedom of trinidadian living i do not doubt it's a beautiful place i do not doubt the look of the place that has nothing to do i'm not insulting the country i'm not insulting the culture i'm not insulting the people i'm not insulting their way of life that's not my point my point is when you look at the corruption levels in those places when you look at the government styles when you look at how many of them are run by authoritarians dr rowley makes one bad speech and he's painted as a dictator for the rest of his life just as mr manning was before him that's the way it is in trinidad and tobago you don't dare you don't dare tread upon upon people's freedoms and these same people are saying that they would easily go live in an authoritarian theocracy yeah right we're not far from that fab khalifa i understand you are a unionist but this is my very problem with the opposition in Trinidad and the unions. The exaggeration they use oftentimes hides the entirety of their point. We're not far from a dictatorship. Are you? Like, do you honestly believe this? I would like you to enter win the afterlife if you're still here and we can discuss this. And I would like to see as we talk about issues factually, bring up 
points that you could verify with articles and i would like you to point out how we are indeed not far from a dictatorship that is demonstrably not true that is not true in a dictatorship all this bobby head talk you all giving rowley that done that done in some one of these countries was it angola or someone of this the, the the president got fed up someday and he went down to the parliament and say you know what let's um we'll suspend parliament for a while and forget about the, judici the judiciary i'll rule by decree for the next couple months that's how a dictatorship is run that's not what happens in trinidad and tobago we are very far from that. The first thing to go is freedom of speech. We can't say anything. Well, we cannot say anything, but we can say a lot. We are so blind and spoiled, a little hard time, and we think we badly off. Now, the thing with this is the the aggravation some of these false criticisms give me is that they obscure the genuine criticisms because they are genuine crit. Listen. That's the majority of my content. The majority of my content is what I deem to be legit criticisms of Trinidad and our governance structure and our, governan our governing people, our politicians. But when you come with ridiculous things made up out of whole cloth that do not add up to the reality of things, they don't help with your argument and realistic people roll their eyes at you. So, to the people that, that say they'd rather live in Malaysia or Oman, like, think about it honestly. Thank you, Chico Titi. Think about it honestly. And think if you would really be okay with living in a dictatorship. So, what can we do? We'll get to some more of that. We will get to some more of that. But there are some more, there are some more stories that we'd like to get into that pertain to this very same thing. As... There has been lots of pushback because politics is heating up in this very moment. So there has been quite a bit of pushback to the increase in fuel prices. And let's go through some of this and see if it all makes sense and see what's the point that some people are saying. Just making sure your phone plug in, bro. <laughs> yes, my phone is plugged in. All right. Gas pushback. Duke. Do not. Duke. No, not do not. Sorry. No to gas hikes take it off take it off shouted watson duke yesterday as he promised massive protests in his call to the government to not raise gas prices duke, duke who leads the progressive democratic patriots made the call during yesterday's launch of the party's first office in trinidad on 132nd second street barataria in the the official launch of the party in trinidad is carried for may the first last friday we know call Bert what he said duke said the price hike was a disrespect we have had enough of that gas price. Take it off. Take it off. Colombia is not so bad if you have money. Wouldn't want to live in any of the others. Colombia is not bad if you have money. But then Trinidad isn't bad if you have money either. So at least we still have subsidy. Many first world countries don't. That was part of the, re the reason I read through the entire list. Even, even with the increase, our subsidy... Our subsidy still leaves us at about the cheapest of any country that people would deem a free country. We have about the cheapest fuel of any country that may be deemed a desirable country to move in and a free country. Now, you may wonder, here's something that I wonder when I read through that list. I wonder if there's a causation amongst the correlation is there something hinged to that rock bottom low fuel price that helps to precipitate some of those difficulties in governing these countries because it seems like the lower the fuel price when you look at this list the more difficult it is to govern the country so is it that difficult countries drop their fuel prices or is it that low fuel prices make it difficult? I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just wondering. I'm just wondering because there is some correlation there. I don't know what's the cause. But Duke says take off that fuel price business. Take it off. Take it off. Take it off. Take it off. 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 And 
I wish that could have happened like that. This again is some of my critique of some of the criticisms. All right, take off the gas prices. But what does that mean? When people talk about capping the gas prices, when people talk about dropping the gas prices, let's be honest about what that means. That means subsidize the gas. So when you say take off, take off, or when you say drop the prices, what you are actually calling for is please subsidize the gas. Put more subsidies. I said more subsidies on that gas. And okay, if that's what you want to call for, that is fine. But bear in mind that there are many people that agree or seem to agree that subsidies do cause some problems. There, there have been calls to remove our subsidies since they have been put on, to be very honest. Because what you'd hear some economists say is that the subsidies kind of skew the economy to make things unrealistic. So you may develop a, what you call that, that we're having, a supply chain. You may develop a supply chain based upon fuel prices that are unrealistic to market value. And that is problematic. So now that the subsidies are uh, being removed, then you would see the actual prices of some of these goods start to develop and come up. And then it would look like these prices are rising. While part of it is that the subsidy was falsely making it look like it was lower than it was. It's time to do something and stop talking. The Truth 265, that is about the most horrible advice that you could give anyone. Stop talking and do something. Do what? Do what? How do we decide what we do if we do not discuss it first? And if there isn't proper discussion, listen. The idea that just doing something, anything, let's at least do something, would somehow result in a better conclusion is actually ridiculous. If you're trying to build a puzzle, and while we are discussing where should we put, should we build up the end pieces first? You, you come in and decide, well, forget about this, let's just do something and let's start sticking puzzles together. Is that actually going to be a better solution? No, very likely it isn't. And things like that, the just do something, creates lots of revolutions. Lots of revolutions happen all around the world. And to be fair to Mr. Duke, that's basically what he's calling for too. Revolution, he's not calling this just some new party, it's revolution. And that's kind of the idea, that's kind of the idea of revolution. We do something, all this talking has to end. Now go look and see how many successful revolutions there were. In my understanding of history, I believe there was one, the American Revolution. And I believe that was successful because there was an excess of talking and writing based on that revolution. Them fellas couldn't hush up. That's why they had documents upon documents upon documents to look through and see exactly what they view as their revolution, which was kind of not very revolutionary, but more just freedom. But go look and see at all the rest of revolutions in the world and see where they end up. A revolution is something making a full circle, actually. That's what revolution means. Something makes a full circle, it makes a revolution. So the French Revolution left with... <laughs> Only one revolution you know of. Okay, there may be a million different revolutions that have never been recorded, but they were very successful. They were so successful that they just were never recorded in the annals of history. But yes, go look at the French Revolution where they deposed their royal, fa their royal families and the, the, the weight of those aristocrats, they threw them off. And then within a couple generations, they had Napoleon trying to conquer the entirety of Europe. Or go look at the Russians, where they threw off the Tsars. All this, they, they killed the entire Tsar family. They killed the entire Tsar's family. And then in quick time, you end up with Stalin and Lenin. Yeah. Present and past governments have bought their own challenges because of a lack of social dialogue. I agree, Clifton. Samson, businesses never recovered from 1990 and TNT crime level went out of control. I agree with that. Now, here are some further examples of that revolutionary talk. BLM. Aha. The controversial one. BLM. 
Do something. Do something. The black people are dying in the streets. We must do something an organization has developed. Let's donate millions of dollars. People, pop stars, celebrities are telling us donate to this organization. Stop discussing this. Why are you talking? Do you hate black people? Are you racist? Have you now internalized your white supremacy? But no, we should have spoken. Because you go look and you see these BLM people are living in mansions based on your little pittance donations from all over the world. When you when you when you wrote on Nike's Nike's official website and said, Do you not care about black lives? We need to see you do something about black lives, Nike and Nike to do something to help the black lives. I was like, okay, they signed signed off a couple million and sent it to BLM organization. And you're like, yes, I have done something. We did not discuss anything and have done something. The Cuban revolution. The Cuban revolution did not succeed. I know there are many Caribbean people who look to Castro. Yes, Castro. And think, what a wonderful leader. But you are being dishonest. If you have a revolutionary who puts himself as the leader of your country in perpetuity till he dies. And then puts his brother and then appoints the leaders from there. You will hate that place. You like that place because you like the romantic idea of locals revolutionarily leading locals. That is not true. That is not what occurs. Go listen to the horror stories from out of Cuba. Cuba isn't only malfunctioning because of u.s sanctions if cuba had a good economy they wouldn't need the u.s to trade with them for their country to be functional so and the the sanctions against cuba are not actually blanketed for everything so cuba does get to trade elsewhere the the communist style of governance is just impossible and now i understand being a unionist you may be leaning towards that comrade idea more but communism is the is the best field idea known to man and every time it has been tried it killed quite a few million people so i'd prefer we not try that communism business and to be very fair and honest even to my union folks inside of the life that's kind of why i don't trust some of you unions you see that communist lean there yeah we saw we we read animal farm we saw the soviet union we saw north korea we saw that's opinion no that's literal fact there has never been a functional communist government never because what happens is you run out of other people's money the idea of communism is from each according to his ability to each according to his need here's the problem with that someone has to decide another person's ability and someone has to decide another person's need so here's what happened in russia here's what happened in russia and why the ukrainians up till now despised De listen the denmark leader left denmark to go to the united states to let the people know we do not run communism or socialism there they run an expansive free market that allows for a wide social safety net and that's kind of based on their homogeneity homogeneity because they are the same people basically but anyway don't get me distracted i'm going in on russia and those soviets let's go in let's go in <laughs> into into why some of those ukrainians up till now despise russia with with a visceral level of hatred because up till this day ukraine is still kind of the breadbasket of a large portion of europe ukraine has a the ural plains i believe it's called a, a, a wide area of plains in central europe there that is the breadbasket it grows a lot of wheat etc 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 now the slavic people inhabited that that place for quite a long time for quite a long time the slavic people for quite a long time the slavic people in we get to cuba inhabited that place and as the soviet union took over the soviet union promised that we are going to help everyone rise together in in social communism and socialism is actually the same thing in a sense socialism is the is the lead up to communism i forget the way that marx actually stated it that socialism leads to communism in effect 
It is the same idea. Marx, the guy who proposed communism, told us that socialism is the first step towards communism. Come, Think of it as socialism is the walk and communism is the utopia when it arrives. Communism is what you work towards. You work towards a communist country. So if you read the writings, I hope you actually read the writings of communist writers, you'd see them always talk about working towards achieving communism and they achieve communism through socialism the goal of socialism is to be communism thank you that's that's the way it's phrased all right so let's see how that actually worked in the soviet union so the ukrainians made a lot of the the, the food but the leaders of the soviet union were up there in moscow now there was once upon a time that they would produce food and you just have to buy it from them. But not anymore. This is the Soviet Union now. We are doing this whole communist socialist idea from each according to his ability to each according to his need. And it's centrally done, so it's centrally planned. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to tell all the farmers in Ukraine that all of the grain that you grow must be sent to Moscow because the leaders in the party need food to live and to make these decisions. So much so that while they grow the food, they are currently starving. And the Holodomor killed, what, upwards of 30, 40 million people on purpose, starving them to death while they grew the food for you in the central Moscow region. Because that's what central planning does. It's Central planning is like playing the game of chess. The problem with that is that who gets to decide who the pawn would be? No. So here's what we decide. We don't play that central planning game of chess. Every individual makes their own decision. And if you decide to be a pawn for your country, that's your prerogative. But no one can make you do that. We don't do that. There's a reason the communists failed in the, in the Cold War. And it wasn't just the evils of the United States. And those who are in my life know, regularly know that I don't fall short of calling out the United States and their own evils. But free market versus central planning. And here's the thing that I always find so strange about some of the people that ask for more central planning, more socialism style governance. They are angry about the failed, they are angry about the failed ability of politicians to do what they say. And their solution for that is to give politicians more power. That blows my mind. That blows my mind. How can I say that the problem in my system is that politicians are failing at, do at doing their job? So, I'm thinking this through. And how I'm going to solve it is give the politicians more power. That's the idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I, don't, I just, it just seems... I, I don't I don't see the the one two step I don't see the one two step and I find a lot of that is more like chain up to be very honest and I understand how the chain up happens because there is a problem in the economic system there's a problem money accumulate wealth status value accumulates at the top and eventually there's a larger amount of people disadvantaged at the bottom we could see what the system play a game of monopoly play a game of monopoly eventually someone ends up dirt poor and a few people or if you play long enough one person ends up very rich so we do need a system somehow to shovel money down from those that are accumulating too much we do need that i agree I, however, disagree that the ideal system to do that is putting it in the power of politicians to take it from them and yeah, redistribute it better. Mm, no, no, no. Still, the best thing with that is a free market with extremely strong cultural institutions. Anyway, Mr. Duke has formed his new party. 
and he is speaking about it being a revolution they know how to to distribute he's speaking about it being a revolution you know as you say they know how to distribute something interesting with that statistically people when they are charged less in tax pay more out in charity it's just how it happens strange enough and many people who are wealthy almost inevitably end up paying more out not saying they are good people but it's nearly selfishly that way you see in a system the system gets unstable if it gets too heavy at the top so n the wealthy people are aware of that too many of the wealthy people are aware of that so it's even in their best interest to try and share out some of that what really creates the inequality in many systems is when the government gets in there and they put their fingers on the scale so so like if you want to see real inequality go to cuba how much you want to bet this country that has been running this socialist experiment for what the better part of six decades if you go there and you look at the wealth inequality behind cast one of castro's family members versus a regular a regular gardener a regular farmer you'd see the difference you'd see the di i said castro i mean yeah castro there but in in venezuela it's similar chavez chavez's daughter is known to be a play girl in miami while they're out there in venezuela preaching that from him according to his ability to him according to his need we'll all share in this togetherness comrade and yeah there it's 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 animal farm all over again all animals are created equal but some are made more equal than some. Mm. All right. But let's go into Mr. Duke and his political party that he has created. And he has promised us that he isn't going down this coalition road. No. He is not going down that coalition road. Duke, no coalitions with other political parties. Progressive Democratic Patriots political leader and Tobago House of Assembly Deputy Chief Secretary Watson Duke wants to become Prime Minister of TNT. Duke revealed his long-term political ambition while addressing the media during the opening of the party's Trinidad headquarters at 2nd Street Barataria. His intention is that the PDP is to contest all elections in Trinidad and Tobago. And wherever people desire them to be, they will contest those seats too. The PDP does not believe in a coalition, he went on to say. They have not worked. They leave a sour taste in the mouth of the people because after they win elections, they do not last, he said. Now, I think this is a wise statement by Mr. Duke. I think this is some smart politics because I really do think that the taste for coalitions in Trinidad and Tobago has kind of soured. It has kind of soured. People, people aren't going to believe coalitions much more anymore. Where was I? <laughs> we are a political revolution that started on the east side of Tobago, which then swept the whole of Tobago, and now starting in Trinidad. PDP is not a third force, nor do we want to be a third force. The PDP is a political revolution, he added. He called on members of failed former smaller parties to consider joining the PDP. What the PDP is open to is for any person from any political association giving up their political association and joining the PDP. That is how we do it. One commander-in-chief, one army, and one mission. So any one of you over there looking for a party to join, Mr. Watson Solomon Duke is inviting you under his one army with their one leader and their one mission. <laughs> Duke admitted that he was heartened by the feedback he has received during walkabouts in communities in San Juan, Barataria, and East Port of Spain. It has been overwhelming and at times moving one to tears, Duke said. The love that people have for the ones who want to lead them is more than the love that those who led them have for the people that they lead, he added. Duke also expressed confidence that his role in expanding the PDP presence and influence in Trinidad would not affect the parties working the THA. Questioned whether his political ambitions would be affected by the fact that he is still facing criminal charges for sexual assault. This paper just went out there and they went straight for it. Duke dismissed the issue. The media and the courts are saying that. But what are the people on the ground saying? We want Watson. 
We want Watson. I say who the people set free is free indeed. I don't like that statement, you know. I don't like that statement he made there. His defense for being on a criminal charge for something that is quite reprehensible is that the people like me. Because nearly all of our cases take that long. <laughs> Terry Allen's. Nearly all of our cases take that long. But I find that to be such a poor defense. Like, the people liking you needs to be added on to the fact that you're innocent. Like, the people liking you isn't good cause for you ignoring a criminal charge. Like, what are you talking about? Mr. Adolf himself, you know, back in World War II days, Mr. Adolf himself was actually quite popular. He came into power, voted in by popular elections. So the people liking you, I don't get it. But therein is part of the problem with revolutions. Because we don't sit and talk, we just do something. You need to think through what you're going to do. Anyone innocent until proven guilty, Christopher Scott says, I agree. I always talk about this. You are innocent until proven guilty. But that's not what the question was asking. And that's not even what he answered. He didn't answer saying he's innocent. He didn't answer saying he's innocent until he's proven guilty. He says basically the people like him and the people want him. I don't see that as being a good excuse. And I think this whole do something and just get into the numbers and what the people say and whip the people up into a frenzy is exactly how you end up with leaders such as Adolf back in those days. It's because populism could could be swept up on the tide of something. You So if you, you sweep someone in on the emotion of something and it feels in the long run. So yeah, what y'all think do? What you all think about that party? You all think that the chances are alive and well for that party? That the chances are high? And what do you think about the idea, too, of multiple parties now entering the fray? Because it's now the PDP, the PEP. Multiple parties are now here in the fray. And we'll see what they have in their in their arsenal to offer now i was reading mr alexander's response to this the leader of the pep and something stood out to me here something something stood out to me here alexander was talking about all these eventualities and he was talking about his party increasing in popularity the public response to the third parties now is an open embrace this is mr alexander talking here the size of our following i have never been as popular as i am now and i think that it says something alexander said in an interview last week alexander said the racial politics must end the racial divide and the voter padded political structure we have will obviously have some say but if people are polled now and you put keith rowley kamala Prasad, besessa philip alexander Watson, you can Gary Griffith as choices. You will find that Kamala and Keith might lose in a national poll. That again is something significant. He said, "Here's the thing: I don't believe that for one second. I don't believe that for one second. Run them. You do not come in my live to spam your advertisement, sir. That's not what we do. You'll be." Run. <laughs> Run them. Anyway, Mr. Alexander said that if you put himself, Watson Duke, Gary Griffith, Keith Rowley, and Kamala Posad for a, a, a national poll right now, that he thinks the alternatives would win. You know, I don't actually believe that. I, I, I really don't actually believe that. Like, no. I, like, some people I think over. All right. The, many of these politicians are not liked. Many of these politicians are not liked a whole lot by many people. But I think some people 
overestimate how hated some politicians are and underestimate how loved some of these politicians are you, the politician who you might dislike the most the politicians who you might dislike the most might shock you at the kind of popularity popularity they have amongst their circle listen miss posad Bissessa cannot win an inter a national election for anything these days but you cannot remove her as the leader of her party there's a brigade inside of the unc that has tanti kamala down as the mother of the nation as the mother of the nation queen mother kamala and they aren't moving her from that view i am sorry mr alexander but i don't know you probably seeing something different on the ground from me but i just do not see that as being likely do not i have no doubt though that these third parties would indeed make or have an effect i have no doubt about that i have no doubt that they would have an effect that's that seems obvious to me because as we regularly speak about here the reality is that trinidad and tobago's politics is not serving everyone ideally many people are becoming more and more disenchanted sorry with the way that trinidad and tobago has been carrying about politics for some time now many people are disenchanted with that so the third parties i believe would get, would gather traction however the reality is in our first past the post style voting system it almost always inevitably comes back down to two parties because you'll be voting you more likely vote against the party that you hate the most than for the party that you like the most and for a third party to win they would usually have to convince you that they should be the party that you like the most and that they can win for example if you are in san juan barataria and you are usually a pnm voter and the pdp enters and you're liking you liking the look of the pdp you know but unc is the worst one to you just don't like those people them people is real old teeth i could never vote for unc if them get back in control of this country things done this country mash up for sure so good you cannot get let unc get back in power so now as election rules are wrong you're looking at your your marginal district in san juan barataria then you're wondering you're wondering to yourself if you vote for the pdp the chances are they may not win but the votes that would have gone to the pnm wouldn't go there now the unc might win and obviously the political parties are very much aware of that predicament and they advertise and they suggest that to you constantly i remember when the cop came out there was this constant proclamation about stealing the votes and don't let them steal your votes and don't let them steal your votes and stealing the votes and stealing the votes and it kind of it kind of worked so i'm not sure how the third party to me for the third party to win for the third party to win you need the third party to fully depose one of the two major parties that's what needs to happen and here's the thing i do not see any party fully deposing the pnm which was the political party founded by the first prime minister who was there when trinidad and tobago got independence I just don't see a party fully deposing the PNM with that kind of structural pedigree. Also, I do not see another party, at least not easily, fully deposing the UNC. I think to fully depose the UNC, it needs to, as it will, come from inside the UNC and eat it from inside and then cre recreate it that way. But to come from some other place and just displace the UNC in a front on battle, uh, that ain't going to happen. The UNC's base is the strongest base in Trinidad and Tobago. 
you need to relax yourself. That's not happening either. So if the PNM nor the UNC are going to de be deposed as being either ends of the two top poles in a kind of two horse race in the first past the post system it makes it so much more difficult for third parties i'm not saying it's impossible just very difficult plot twist michaela panley comes out and takes the pnm and unc by surprise lol i i've heard people talk about this but i don't see it happening here's how michaela panley can win and this is what i see about this it may not even be the ideal, but this is what I say about this. If Michaela Panley somehow gets into the UNC and takes leadership of the UNC, yeah, that may be dangerous because then Michaela Panley may have some cross-sectional appeal in the East-West Corridor and the UNC always has their contingent of safe seats and yeah. That may be dangerous, but Michaela Pandey on her own, the, 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 the base of her strength is the same base of the UNC's strength, and that base is not going to leave the UNC and vote for a third party and risk the PNM coming into power again. That's not happening. Would the financiers allow a third party to come in and disrupt their system of returns? As I said, I don't even believe a third party will disrupt that system. So I don't even know if the financiers would have a say in that. And what if the system is running functionally, even with the financiers in there, the most they could do is advertise against it. So what is it about Michaela Pane? I can't understand it. She doesn't say anything. It's legacy. Part of it is legacy. My, this is, I'm going to state my personal opinion here. We are close to the end, and tonight we aren't having the afterlife chat. My nose is starting to sound a little stuffy tonight. I'm going to just take a nice little relax. You know what we do sometimes. Not every night we talk all that much. You know, I, even I must rest the voice occasionally. But yes, this is my theory. My theory is that humans, people, homo sapiens, us as a species... Our natural default governing state is feudalism. I think so. Our natural state that we would revert to if not... Yes, I follow on, on Twitter. If not controlled or pushed for any other thing would be a feudal system. Feudal system is the system of lords and then the lords into a king, etc., etc., or monarch, generally speaking. And people almost naturally do that. You look at people in a community and they would naturally choose someone among the community that they would willingly heap adulation upon and even in some cases heap rewards upon to be a person that shows the image of this community in a positive light and that would be the lord of their community and it seems like many people a lot of people look like they wish for that like if we could have a lord of our community that we can focus everything on and they seem to have it with that hereditary hereditary lean too the person who was it before their child whoever their child is they look to their child with that similar adulatory eyes like what are you going to do are you going to do something i think that's the natural state of humanity that's my view like if they if you just throw people into the wilderness and you allow them to recreate from the ground up they are going to form into lords and ladies and the lords over this the lord over his parish and then then you'd have overlords over them and the dukes and then ultimately the monarch and stuff i think that's the natural way that humanity develops and when you switch that into some of our more democratic systems you see some strange things happening like in some cases political leaders who are pushed to the front and have no real political pedigree just because their parents were in it before so yeah but there's that. I'm not. This isn't saying that Michaela doesn't have political pedigree. I think the lady can talk. I mean, she is Mr. Pandey's daughter. So talking, I believe, is a prerequisite there. But <clears throat> would that be enough to rule a country? Would that be enough to move people to choose you to rule a country? I don't know. But I kind of doubt it. At least outside of the, 
the power of the UNC establishment. All right, that's all I have for now, folks. I thank you for being here. I hope you're educated, informed, or entertained. But I must say goodbye. And I will see you again for the next Mindful Life tomorrow at 9.30 p.m. And be sure to tune in. Tomorrow we'd have the afterlife chat where, you know, we could stay around and discuss. And I hope when I'm in the swing of my monologues and I address someone saying something in the comments and you know, I go off heated and uh, ramble, you don't think it of it as an offense. I do appreciate the, the conversation and even the pushback. Do pushback. Keep respectful and do pushback. It encourages the discussion to move along. Goodbye to whom? Goodbye to everyone, Nisi. Goodbye to everyone. We aren't having the afterlife chat tonight, unfortunately. So I will see you all again tomorrow night. Peace.